preparing to live stream. How's that? Oh, that's much better. Okay, cool. Good. Ooh, okay. I guess I should check to make sure we're actually live. This meeting is being live streamed. Hooray. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey technology man it's always so nice when it works yeah <laughs> oh so we get, we do have one minute but yeah, i'm we'll, super we'll, excited that it seems to be working how much time are we going to be on today well i mean as long as you want to talk but i think wait i think zoom limits us to 45 minutes okay that's Just, fine yeah Well, it, it doesn't, oh wait, there we are. Okay, I see it, okay, we're all good. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very good at this, okay. That's great, that's good. Okay, so it's one o'clock, let's go ahead and start. Would you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay. I'm Michael Warwick, um, I'm a sculptor and I work here in Little Rock and I placed uh, pieces, a number of, probably a dozen pieces around Little Rock and then I placed pieces in Maine and Texas and California, large scale monumental works. Then I also do small scale, intimate size, figurative works in uh, clay and wood and bronze and aluminum. So. And you, you were teaching at Euler. Have you. I'm still there for the not one more semester. So I'm, I'm, I'm retiring from the university of Arkansas, Little Rock after this is my 32nd year, I'll be retiring there in, in May and I'll go to part-time and work towards being an emeritus professor. So. I've been here in Little Rock for 32 years, so it's a great place to be. I love the state of Arkansas. I feel very at home here. So, and when when you talk about your sculptures, what kind of metal? Like, and you you pour, right? Like, tell us a little bit about your process. Well, so part of my process is uh, I'll just kind of walk through maybe a new piece that I'm working on right now um, that we're that's actually in the kiln. Um, it is a female figurative piece. It's uh, life size. It uh, doesn't have any arms or head, but it's just it's more about the body from the neck down to, to just below the knees. So it's it'll be a hundred pound um, cast bronze work finished product. Uh, the mold is about 1500 pounds right now. It's plaster and sand and it's in a kiln. It'll be in that kiln for about another five days at a thousand degrees. And that will melt out all the wax that that pattern that I've worked in will, will be vacated. And then uh, Monday morning we'll come in and we'll pour that 100 pounds of bronze into that mold. So it's quite an undertaking to invest about 85 gallons of plaster and sand all within about an hour, carefully with delicacy and with finesse. And so it's a pretty interesting process. So the concept is about, it's called Memento Mori. It's about, um, I've had, numerous women friends in my years that have lost children or who could not conceive and so I'm doing a piece in honor of them so I get choked up when I get to talking about that but Aww. my sister's one of them and so I wanted to do a piece that has to do with uh, mementos and memories and it has to do with the idea of paying an honor of somebody who's not able to do something that they've always wanted to do but couldn't and so it's part of a larger series I've been working on. Um, I, this is the second part of that uh, female series. I did the front this earlier this fall, and then uh, that cast beautifully. That's being sandblasted this week. And then um, I did a series of four male figures, both front and back. Two of them were self portraits, and then they they were they were discussing a lot of uh, memory issues in in, in the figure. So. So on the front side of each one of those forms are like, as an example, like on, my, on, the, on, the, on the female ones, there's actually a, a baby's baptismal gown that I've dipped in wax that I've placed into a, a, a plaster mold along with buttons, clock keys, uh, baby booties, baby gloves, all a lot of us in, in fiber. And so once I dip those in wax and drape them into the mold, the female form mold, then I'll encase that into the plaster and sand mold, put that into a kiln for a week, and then at a thousand degrees, and that burns out all that, all those objects and all that wax. And then I pour in the bronze and then dispose of all the plaster and sand. So it's it's a quite a 
pretty intense, a lot of physical work just to break out the mold, break the figure, the bronze out of the, the plaster mold takes usually about four or five hours of me working at it with an ax and a jack hammer, hammer and chisels just to do that. And then, so it's quite an intensive process, but it's the, the ultimate you know goal is to be able to say something about what we go through, you know, in terms of my friends, my family, my, you know, my brothers and sisters, what they deal with. So I didn't kind of do something. So this is actually a piece, not for anybody in particular. It's just a work that I want, I developed, uh, starting about this time last year. And then I wanted to do both male and female parts of that. So it's a pretty exciting approach, but it's. Well, well where did you get the, uh, the the items that you incorporate into the mold the things that eventually oh, get evaporated but are still preserved in some sort of ethereal sale, sense yeah I, I get those at estate sales antique malls and so i think i should be entering the 12-step program for uh, collecting old things any day now so <laughs> i mean that's kind of great i like get the ability to be able to reuse and sort of explore your surroundings do you ever get ideas just from going out and going oh, to yeah. estate sales and looking through like people's memories would have to be all over that yeah i was in uh oklahoma city for about four or five years ago and i was work, started had just started a new clay series these portraits in clay and wanted to do something different like maybe patterns or tattoos or something i wasn't sure and I was at the antique mall and I was looking at stuff and I saw these doilies from England and they're like, they're like, they had to be 30, 40 years old. And they're all handmade. They're just very delicate. So I bought a bunch of those. And then I took a little ink press roller and pressed them into the cheekbone and, uh, and the forehead of this, of this clay portrait. And I really liked the, the, the texture. And then I was able to accentuate that with stains and so forth. And excuse me. And it really kind of made the piece a lot more interesting. And then I thought about last year, because I had done that with a number of clay pieces, I thought maybe I could do something else with those. And so a little over a year ago, I started experimenting with the notion of taking actual objects like cloth and then investing it into plaster and sand mold, burning it out and casting it. So I've done things like that, but with wood. So a number of figures that I've built over the years have been like, I collect up branches from my yard, I'm compulsive. And so I'm probably only, and I probably have 12, 12 step programs over my lifetime. So, but the collecting the branches, I'll use the branches and I'll take those and I'll, I'll put those into a plaster and sand mold, burn that out, replicate it in bronze and I'll assemble a figure out of one of those. So that's another piece that I did this last year. It was a full life-size figure of me made out of branches that were cast in bronze. So taking found objects and then disposing up, burning them out up in a kiln and then replicating them in bronze. It's just part of what I've done, but I've never done it with cloth like that before. So um, I think the last time, one of the last art interviews that we had was at the Boswell Moreau Gallery a little over a year ago. And I had some um, portrait pieces done in a similar fashion. They were probably about three, four times life size. And then, um, Part when I was, I was just beginning to use the doilies for that too, for smaller works. Well, to me, small is like two or three feet. <laughs> so um, I had sculpted these large portraits, probably about two, three feet in di diameter and made a mold of them. And then I took the doilies and, the, and all kinds of cloth stuff, dipped it in wax and draped it into the mold. And so, and then put that into the plaster and sand mold and then burned all that out and then uh, replicated. So then you could see that, I mean, the detail that I could get every little strand of cloth that was in that mold you know, in that original piece is there within that form. So attaching memories to objects is kind of what I do, but find, you know, knowing what the memories really are. So since you kind of find those objects at places, one of them that I found this summer was a a couple of baptismal gowns and it remind me of what I had lost track of my own children's baptismal gowns. And I thought, well, this will replicate. Now I, I can destroy this one and it won't, <laughs> won't be a big deal if I do. And so that, that gave me the idea to do the piece in honor of all my women friends and family. So. And you were talking about doing another piece too, with a uh, more um, multi-sensory art involved if oh, I remember correctly. Yeah. This, this uh, September, I spent the month of, month of September 
uh, riding on a, on a project for, um, I applied for a Guggenheim fellowship. And so I started a month early. Um, my writing needs multiple editing to get where it needs to be. And so for the first two weeks, I didn't get real far, but I got where I, I, I was kind of interested in. I liked it, but I wasn't real sure about it. Threw it away, started over. Spent another two weeks writing and developing a piece and then connected up with my daughter, Annika. And then she kind of helped me work through some of the, the ideas that I wanted to try to develop and, and that got to mature level. And so the, the, the piece is called uh, Liminality, uh, the proposal that I wrote. And it's about the place between. And so if you interpret that way, there's many ways you can interpret it, but the way that I was interpreting it as a large scale temporary sculpture installation was it was gonna be the place between life and death. And so some people might call that purgatory, some people, well, there's all kinds of names for it, but I like the idea that it doesn't have a specific name. It's just a, and it's not even a place, it's just an idea. And so, um, one part of that I think that we talked about was the, the large portraits that I had done over the last three years included um, I, or got included in this proposal. So um, the scale of the heads were like 20, 30 inches in diameter. And uh, then to, as you came upon those in the installation, that triggered a voice and that voice was the actual voice of the person whom the portrait was of and so since i've got you know multinational friends like from russia from italy from you know that are spanish that you know men women old and young and and and, and then uh, non-binary students so it's got an interesting I'm, I'm real drawn to the idea of creating a place that gives you um, a summary in a sense, seven stanza poem about a person's life in their language. So that was part of this was the, that, that's it, about a, the larger, I'd say about 30 or 40% of the, the project was to do the large portraits. So as you came in in the environment, you'd hear, the first thing when you would come across was you'd see my large portrait. And then that would trigger a, 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 a motion sensor, which would trigger my voice uh, reading a seven stanza po poem about my life. And then as you moved into the environment, you'd trigger other people in Russian and Italian, Spanish, Chinese, any number of languages and all the, all the portraits. And then as a vocal backdrop, I've talked to a, a composer to create a piece that's vocal, but non, non language oriented as a backdrop to this notion of, of vocalizing your biography. And so it grew out of a lot of different things. And that's kind of, that's the, that's the real, that's the real dynamic part of the whole piece is to, to develop something that I hope will, is, uh, I get funded for. I just finished actually this morning sending in my, uh, my imagery for that. So I sent in images that covered, gosh, from 1989 through till 2021. So I sent in images of 10, Figurative works and then 10 installation works. And so it was kind of an equal balance of that. So installation sculpture is really kind of a temporary um, design of a space with a specific idea in mind. And so hopefully that's helpful. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. It, it does. And um, you're also the 2020 Arkansas Living Treasure. And mm -hmm. when we talk about that, they that particular award sort of concentrates on the craftsmanship or the uh, maybe the historical methods used to produce mm -hmm. some sort of art or uh, mm -hmm. craft. And I just wanted to know if you could talk about a little bit how your method fits into that. And um, I guess if you would encourage other people to nominate or, or apply or- Well, I, I I'll, I'll answer the latter part of that first, because I think that the, the most important thing as artists is to be recognized and, and to be fulfilled through their work. Um, and so when someone else makes the effort to nominate you for um, something, whether it's a fellowship or scholarship or, or you know, an exhibition, or, and especially the living treasure, it means a lot to both the individual, but it's also to recognize the craft that um, that's been pursued by that individual over a lifetime. For me, it's over, I it encompassed 50 years of working in metal. 
And so as a sculptor, part of what I've done is I've worked both as a, as a ceramicist, I've worked as a set designer for dance companies, I've worked as a large scale fabricator, I've done large scale temporary works, I've done small commission works, monumental commission works. So the, the kinds of things that I've done over my career are diverse, but the main core of what I've done has been working in metal. And that's what I was recognized for, the, the craft of working in metal. So really, I started working in metal in high school um, and then continued doing that as a welder for many years and then also expanded out to working in cast metal and then also large scale fabrication. So it's just it's, it's just it just continued to develop. And so really, it was a really enriching experience to write the career narrative for that. Um, to realize that you've been doing something, you don't even think about it, you just do it, that you've been doing something for over 50 years, but not just doing it, but doing it to learn more about not only specific metal, like metal like bronze, aluminum, steel, Corten steel, um, pewter, and, um, and then working with then in different ways, but that's only part of it. The most important part is passing on that knowledge. And that's part of what, um, uh, that, that, that the most important part of what the living treasure wants to recognize is because keeping the knowledge to yourself isn't as, as, as important as passing it on. So passing that on through, and I've, there's a ways that I've done that. One is that teaching at UALR for 32 years, um, teach where I taught in South Dakota, teaching weekend workshops or work long, week long workshops, um, doing lectures to architects, um, doing exhibitions, I mean, but, and I've, I've hosted lots of guest artists. I've, most of my friends have come to the studio and I put them to work and say, okay, you're gonna learn how to cast bronze today. You're gonna, you're gonna play in wax, you're gonna make something and then you're gonna learn about this. So, that, and then they do. And then that changes sometimes the course of what they do with their work and their career, so. But well, that reminds me, didn't you recently, that reminds me, you recently did uh, some sort of public pour or a live demonstration? I saw, yeah, it on we, the, I saw it on the Facebooks. Oh, well, yeah, we did We did one uh, probably about a month ago. Right. November. Yeah, that was uh, the, the Arts Council was, uh, or no, actually UALR was hosting the Arkansas Art Educators, and they were at school. And of course, sometimes being a little bit preoccupied with teaching and, and working, I, I don't see things on the calendar like, hey, there's a, there's a statewide... Our educators are going to be in, in our department that day. And I told the, the, our coordinator for recruiting, hey, I'm going to be pouring bronze tonight. If there's anything happening, she goes, did you not like read the memo, Michael? And I'm like, what, what? You know, she says, well, we've got 40, 50 art educators here today. I said, so that's good timing. And I'm like, okay, well, invite them on down. And so we had about 40, 50 people pour or watch this pour metal. And so I had um, one of my students and one of my friends came and we uh, poured metal for them. And Two, two of the molds were done by one of the students. And then right after that first pour, we were gonna do a large mold, like the one that I was just talking about, the Memento Mora piece. And then Electronic Eye and the relay went out on our furnace so we couldn't pour it. But fortunately, we were able to pour the first couple and got the student work done. But in the process, we spilled about, you know, a pint of molten metal onto the grating. And there was a in that video, so that's the first time that's happened to me in 50 years to spill some molten metal. And then, of course, that's all on video. That's all live on. That's all live. And you're like, so, <laughs> and it was right between think of about a molten metal. Had it not been between my feet, I'd be missing a foot. And so. Anyway, but that was that was pretty exciting, very interesting, and and then <laughs> you oh. know when you when you decided <laughs> to do things, it, it can be a little bit more exciting than you sometimes. So go ahead. Yeah, but that's, that's what uh, I'm seeing the Hobbit where he does the ring and then he loses the finger, but I think that was a thing involved with like a monster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was hoping not to lose anything that day. Mostly, yeah. I just lost a little bit of credibility, but that was the worst of it. But we tried to gain that back with, with humor, so that worked out really well. <laughs> we had a great audience, and, 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 the, and the students' molds worked out really well. Then the next week, we poured my big piece, and it turned out perfect, so there weren't any issues. Well, do you, do you have any um, video 
that you wanted to share or any anything that that uh, you wanted to point to to some See, showcase I, some of the stuff that you did okay if i can figure out how to get to not, not really today but I'm, i might send you some stuff no i'm just gonna oh, okay <laughs> I thought about looking it up. We have some stuff on our YouTube from uh, 2020 when we, we did a video, but um, some of your other stuff, where, where can people go to see some of your process or some of your works? Where would you like to send them? Well, I'll just be real simple. You can Google just Michael Work <laughs> and you'll find tons of stuff. If you go to go to YouTube, you just go to Michael Work and, and then you'll see stuff on there. If you go to Michael Work LLC or Instagram, you'll see stuff my daughter annika posts all that work for me and she's very nice about it i feel like you just did like a, let me google that for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay if you just google michael work images you'll find you know, lots of stuff and but on youtube and instagram both so so those are those are good sources there won't be as much humor it'll be just kind of just flat but it, it's just the way it is but uh, well that, that's okay because it's got that metal and yeah. I, it's real pretty except yeah. it's real yeah uh, I, have to, I happen to have a little bit of, uh, I guess, fire fear. Like, I don't want to die by fire. I've already, like, well, eliminated, I mean, like, nobody the Nobody wants, yeah, <laughs> nobody wants fire. But see, uh, as a kid, I was I was always, you know, I was a camping. We camped a lot. We always made fires. We had a fireplace. So I've always been around and conscientious about that and how to and what not to do. And I've never been more burning more than just real minor in my whole lifetime. And so as a welder, I've set my clothes, my shirts and pants on fire a couple of times. And so, you know, without any panic or any, any burns, I've been fine. Um, so, and I've been around kilns in ceramics with uh, Raku ceramics and uh, firing kilns for, you know, 30, 40 years. Plus I've done furnace stuff around uh, uh, furnaces and kilns at school for foundry work. And so I'm very conscientious about the safety element of that. So. To actually have, ever, have you ever set your hair on fire? Because I did that in 2020. No, I have not. I'd say the 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 only burn <laughs> that I've ever gotten was in '92. I uh, we were casting iron iron at UALR with my uh, former instructor, and the fuel source is like, it's called like refined coal. It's called coke, and as part one, sometimes in the furnace it will blow a little cinder ball up in the air. Well, one went down the back of my shirt. <gasps> So I did a little dance, you know, where I've got some, a little tiny welding ball, like down in my boot before you do a little dance. And so you just kind of move with the rhythm of burnt. <laughs> but that's the worst that's ever happened to me, fortunately. So I'm very blessed to have not had any issues over that. But I'm very, very conscious about the safety features. And when I'm having someone help us in the foundry, I'm, I do a, a long step safety process and, and work through that so that they feel very and then we got safety gear we have uh, leather aprons spats um, jackets and, and then gloves and face shields and everything so we're, we're pretty well protected but even still you can make a mistake but that, that's why we go through that real carefully and safely with them so that there's no issues so have you when you're when you're teaching students have you run into any any problems that they've faced or have you well, mo mostly them not listening, but no, that happens only once in a while, of course. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> or that I, that's why I, 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 I repeat things quite a bit when it comes to safety. So and I, when I'm walking a group or an individual through the safety lecture, I, I'll, I'll walk them through it. I'll repeat myself two to three times. And then I'll, then I'll show them individually how to do it. Then I'll watch them. And then make sure that they they've heard everything and got everything, so they they make mistakes. And then if I come up on you and you are ignoring that part of that lecture, um, then I'll stop you and I'll correct you, and I'll show you how to do it right again. And then you can't absorb that at that point. I'll say you're done. Ooh. You need to go home. Ooh. You're done <laughs> for the day. You need to go home. And then I go why? Well, you're not listening, so I can't have you not listening and be heard so yeah we've not had any issues with students over the years because of the, all this, the safety stuff and that's real important to have i mean creativity is important but safety is more important so but it, well um so most speaking people, of, oh go ahead go ahead no oh, i was just i was gonna move no, on to creativity because you know i'm uh yeah. i was just thinking like uh 
do you have any advice for people for how to develop that? Like some of your work is phenomenally intricate and creative and thoughtful and incorporates a lot of the human experience into one thing. And I was just wondering if you had any advice on how to evolve as an artist, how to incorporate that kind of thinking into your pieces so that you can be, you know, an exhibited artist across Arkansas or internationally. Basically, how do we be you? <laughs> well, uh, you work at it for one. Um, I think keeping a journal, and I keep kind of a journal slash sketchbook. So I do writing and drawing in it. And I've got not just one, but I've probably got five or six hidden someplace. And I keep one with me when I'm traveling, when I'm going to school, coming back. If I'm going to have coffee, I've got a sketchbook with me. And so you never know when inspiration is going to strike. And so I think if, you know, as, a, as, a, as a visual person and as somebody who, who likes to write about what I do, sometimes it's actually faster to write it out and then just do a real rough sketch. And I just keep building and I keep building and keep accumulating that. And so when I do kind of hit a point where I go, I wonder what I was thinking about, you know, I just, I'll just go, oh, what did I do last week? And I look at what I've done and, and I go, oh, I need to develop that. So then it's, just a point of departure, then I'll develop it even more with, with the notion of uh, with more drawings. And then we get more, more of an idea and I thought, like, okay, I'll just keep working on it and I'll develop maybe into a material, whether it be wax or cloth or something, I'll just keep working on it. But so I've got hundreds of drawings, but maybe five or 10 sculptures. So th there's a lot of that processing going through that to help me not just weed, not necessarily weed out, but find the better ideas that, that holds true to the notion of what you, you know, the core or the core of what you think you're trying to do. So I think first do keep a sketchbook and journal and then be willing to share that once in a while. And because what happens when you're willing to share that idea or that notion, when you express that to somebody else, all of a sudden the conversation that you've been having with yourself can, can multiply exponentially so much faster because all of a sudden somebody's giving you feedback on what you're thinking about. And then, then it could grow and, and it'd be a tremendous idea. And so then also that trial and error of finding out what people think about what you do can be a great asset. And taking that risk and going out there, I think really makes a huge difference. So once you kind of get the sketches developed and then experiment, start building models or, or sketch, um, you know, sketches that could be not just drawings, but they could be in clay, they could be in wire, they could be in a number of materials. So keep building that until you kind of feel like you've got something that you can develop as far as you think you can. And then do many of them, do variations on a theme, do ex ex keep exploring. And so it just keeps evolving. And then one thing will grow three or four others sometimes too. That's the best part of that. But so, I'd say- So think about ahead. it as a series. So, or is that like- Well, it's, it's like an evolution. It's like, what you're building is you're building a relationship with, with ideas. Just like if you're, I mean, you go to a party, you're not just going to talk to one person. You're going to talk to a couple of people, maybe a dozen people, maybe 50 people. But the more communication you have about this idea that you have, the more feedback you got, the more true it might become, the might, it might evolve into an area that you would never do by yourself. But if you get feedback, so that, that can be very important. Be willing to share and be, be willing to not take it as a, as an attack, they say, well, what have you thought about this? What about that? What do you consider this? You know, look at this material. Maybe that, maybe, you know, help you find your way through that work. When do you know a, an idea is not a good idea? Like you, you've, you've thought it out. You, at one point you're like, this is a great idea. And then suddenly you should, like, you're like, that's really not a good idea. Like yeah. I, I do this all the time where I'm like, and no. <laughs> Do you ever have a moment where you're just oh, like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, I, I mean, oh, man. <laughs> no, that, that. that's not good. I'll just rip it up, you know, or, you know, in this, in some cases I'll, I may have made it. And then a year later I go, you know, I'm not, I'm not too keen on that piece. I've, I haven't photographed it for some reason. Why haven't I not photographed it for some reason? Okay. So maybe it's not as good as I thought it was, or maybe it sucks. Maybe it's awful. So then I just destroy it. And I think that's good. That's cathartic. And that's, that's a good way to kind of, Call the herd, you know, eliminate the stuff that's not as good and keep the things that are good. But not all ideas are created equal and not all ideas are, are good. Uh, and I think if you can understand what's not good about it, it's even better and you're less likely to repeat it. But if you don't, then it's just, it's just matter and intuitive discerning process, which I think is good to do. But um, 
Yeah, I'd say that's why sketching's cheap. Building big is not. So <laughs> yeah. building a big, ugly, bad idea is like. <laughs> <laughs> that that sounds terrible. That sounds terrifying. Like you spent all of this work. I'm sorry, sir, but that's a big, ugly, bad idea. You, you shouldn't have shown that. You shouldn't have made that. Yeah, I just wondered, like, how do you know when you're making a mistake? Like, that's, I mean, I guess that's life because I'm like. How do you know, like, the next thing is not a mistake, a huge mistake? I always think like this in the fall where I'm like, everything's changing. And then like the New Year's is coming up and like you reevaluate your whole life and all your work. I don't know if you do this. <laughs> I might be a little bit extra. And then like, no. like, how do you move forward and improve and create? And then also acknowledge that some of the stuff you do is crap. <laughs> I, I think that's a natural process. And, and usually you get that, you get that perspective from um being someplace else as an example just being away from it for a, a day or two like one of my practices is to i'll work and then i'll go i'm not sure what to do next so i'm not sure i even like it so i'll leave the room take a break make a cup of tea have a snack come back 15 minutes later or half an hour later and i go okay now i'm looking at it fresh again i have a better perspective and i go let's keep developing it or scrap it start over so doing whatever it takes to kind of get some fresh perspective. Sometimes you need a day or a week, the old term, let me sleep on it. There's, there's wisdom in that, you know, um, if you've ever written a bad note to somebody and you actually delivered it, you realize that was a mistake. <laughs> yes. You should have held on to it for a day like Lincoln did and then let it sit and you can read the next day and go, Oh my goodness. I'm glad I didn't stun that. Or may, I'm glad I didn't create that or I'm glad I didn't make that because it, it's not quite as good as I thought it was last night at one o'clock in the morning or whenever. Um, but the notion of, of, yeah, discernment is, is, is very applicable towards the idea of, of finding the good work over time and then have, having perspective, having, you know, sometimes hours or time and, and months, days, weeks, whatever, away from that. And then hearing what other people see and, and feel and think too. I think that, 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 that's all also good for the discerning process. But. Well, speaking of that and stepping away, uh -huh. how do you feel about whether artists should travel? Like, should we, as artists, be thinking about and seeking out new experiences, maybe taking road trips or going to different countries? Is that a way to actually improve our art or is that just a holiday <laughs> it's both <laughs> having a holiday to take a break away having a mental break from your work i think makes a huge difference because what can happen when you're not when you can you you're open to surprises when you're open to surprises and creativity think the things that, that, that that's the only way that can happen sometimes i think so but going back to part of your original question is should you travel if you can afford it yes if you can't still do it anyway because if because what's going to happen is your your notion of humanity is going to expand good bad or indifferent it's going to expand your notion of who you are is going to expand and, and your notion of what you're capable of and the risk that you can take and resolve will expand so all those things can expand and relate to creativity part of the Things that I've done is to do international arts and residencies or do residencies in different parts of the country and different environments under different conditions, different materials, new people, new place, everything's different. And then you have to figure it out. And then magic happens. Something happens that wouldn't happen in your home studio. It wouldn't happen in your in the place you're all you're at in primarily. So by being willing to have an adventuresome attitude and being willing to explore, I think you you gain so much more. One of the most interesting things that I learned in China was not about art, it was about people. And how much I learned and how much I knew about people based on how I observed them. And I could, I could detect a large part of the kind of personality that they had by their body postures, their facial expressions, their hand expressions. I didn't even have to know their language, but I could understand the kind of person that they were based on how they presented themselves. It was, it was amazing. It was very interesting. I'm glad I went. Yeah. So, but I, and I highly recommend that to anybody if, if that's possible. I was really fortunate before the age of 16 to travel to 36 states around the country and see so much part of the U S that it just, 
it opened my mind to going, I need to do this more. So the adventure was very good. That's kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> you need to go travel. Well, I'm always going, well, hey, what do you want? Let's go do this. Let's go try this. Let's 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 see what this is and let's see, see where that's at. And what I want to go see this. So I'm I'm always I'm really curious. Working hard is really important, but adventure kind of feeds that whole your soul and your intellect and your spirit in really good ways. I love that. I love that. Adventure feeds your soul and spirit. I love that. It's good. Um, we do have uh Loria Grant Eubanks. She says mm -hmm. hello. Hey, so, hello. Yeah. Um I get that feeling a lot of, do you keep up with a lot of your students? They seem to really like you actually. Uh -oh. Well, for some odd reason, I don't know why, but they do. But uh, um, no, I, I just tell them that I was the evangelical preacher in my past life. So that that's you know, when I start preaching the sermon of the new project, that's that's when you really hear the, the, the voice come out. Um, but no, for me, Facebook's keeping up with students and then being out in public, I'll run into students. So, you know, it's just every time I, my kids are like, who was that dad? I said, well, that was so-and-so from 1992. And they go like, that was before I was born. How do you, well, you know, that's just, <laughs> but no, that's part of, that's the best part of being a teacher is that you know, a lot of the little gems that you can pass on to people that are still continuing and in, in who they are through their work. So that's great. I appreciate it. Yeah. I've been very blessed to, 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 to be able to continue at ULR for as long as I have. So. So do you have, is there anything I should have asked that maybe I didn't, something that you wish people knew? Hmm, that's a good question. Man, you almost stumped me there. Um, I think to be able to follow your intuition about where your skills are. As an example, let's say you, I wish I could have taken a drawing class or taken in a history class. Don't wait, do it as soon as you can. Because there's some, some part of your, your intellect, your soul, your spirit, or whatever that needs to be fed, if you can feed it, do it. Because something can happen there that may not be happening in your life that needs that, that can, it can help balance your life, get you back to you know being the person that you've always wanted to be, but you couldn't afford to have time for or couldn't do. And you know, just seeing that. And I was a non-traditional student. I I was I worked as worked in factories, worked in, as a welder and fabricator for a number of years. Then I started college after five years or so. I decided to try to follow that a little earlier than some people, but I'd say no matter when it strikes, that interest in following that muse, whatever that muse is manifests itself as, pursue that because I think it, it uh, makes a difference. And, and, and one about your satisfaction you have with what you've done in your life. And then you come across new people, new things and new ideas that, that you didn't expect. And it'll just, it'll just exponentially grow and develop and it'll, it'll make a difference in, in, in uh, how you feel and what you think and, and how you act every day. So be, follow that muse. It, it does make a difference, Even, no matter how small that is or how large that is. So you're never too old to do that. So um, when, when, if someone is just starting out with um, metalworking, do you have, um, I guess a recommendation for the kind of metal? Should they start with aluminum? Is there a low budget way to kind of start and get the feel for it? Should they start with a class? Like, how do you get into and start learning what you do in a safe manner? Well, don't touch the metal with your raw, raw hand. That's the first. Because <laughs> even if it's black metal, it could be hot. So, <laughs> so just kind of, uh, it's like the stove. Is it on? Well, let's not touch it to find out. So, but, but, um, there's all kinds of places where you can learn to weld um, and learn to fabricate, learn to work with, um, you know, like work with small metals and pewter. You can work with large metals and fabrication. There's all kinds of resources out there. But if you've wanted to, to learn about that, find a way to do that. There's small metals, you know, classes that we have at the UALR. There, you know, and when the um, Arkansas Museum of Fine Arts opens back up another year or so. There will be small metals works there. There's going to be metal fabrication at uh, as part of the furniture program at ULR. There's plus just, uh, there's welding at Pulaski Tech. There's you know there's there's casting at all kinds of schools across the state. There's bladesmithing down in um, um, I think it's uh, is it Wilhelmina? Or? No, it's Texarkana. Yeah, Texarkana. Oh. But I can look it up. I always forget, but yeah, metal. it's there's, new. <laughs> if you want to learn about metal, there's all kinds of sources out there in the state in terms of educational opportunities. I mean, you go over to Historical Arkansas Museum, 
and see uh, uh, Lynn Ray, who does he's a master bladesmith, do blades uh, in in historical building over there with a with a coal fired furnace and a, and, and an anvil and a hammer. It's amazing what he can do, and he does Damascus work, and it's, it's wonderful. So, um, but there's all kinds of sources out there for that. So, um, would you recommend starting with? I mean, I I think this artist may want to do mold molding more than than like welding. I'm assuming, but is there mold making, mold making forecasting as an example? Okay, yeah. There's, I mean, there, it's amazing. You can learn a lot just by watching YouTube. I mean, there's the sources out there, and then there, plus there's Reynolds Advanced Materials. That's where I buy a lot of my rubber and plastic stuff for mold making, based in Dallas. But they've got that's one of many, and they they give free workshops over there uh, on occasion, or they're really cheap. Um, there's workshops through uh, the Complete Sculptor in New Jersey. New Jersey, there's uh, uh, Sculptor Depot in Loveland, Colorado. There's places. So if you want to learn about mold making, there's I'd start with YouTube and then look around where, and that's part of what I do too with some of my advanced students. So yeah. That's, that's so cool. we do metal casting with some of our advanced students, and we do basic mold making with uh, with the intro sculptor students. So that's pretty cool. Um, well, I think th those are all of the, the questions, although Rex Delon Deloney said that uh, he taught your son. Philip, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In what area? What? Uh, Little Rock Central is all he said. I don't know which area. Yeah, 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 that. yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Rex, you should know that my son uh, um, is, uh, is, is practicing architect at this point. So he uh, graduated with uh, uh, with uh, from Fayetteville and from their architecture program. Has been working as an architect here in Little Rock, and is working towards uh, you know enhancing his career more and more every year. So he's doing well. So That's pretty thanks, incredible. <laughs> yeah. And my daughter Annika, we talked about. She's also a creative writer, so the, the you know the, that creativity definitely manifests itself in other ways. But, so. that's uh, that's pretty that's pretty good that you were able to get your your kids interested in the arts. I have found that some kids they're like, no, you do the arts, and therefore I shan't ever. I shall never. I yeah. no. Yeah. Well, I didn't push it. It's what they wanted to do. I think that's part of it was that you know. Uh, trying to cr create and develop environments where they're naturally, where their creativity gets to blossom and grow. I think that's, you know, instead of telling them what to do, here's the environment, play, start, do, and see what happens. And I think that, that, that goes a lot further. You know, I never expected them to be artists or architects or writers. I just wanted to be, you know, have some integrity as a person and, and, and do what you love. So pretty simple guidelines. <laughs> So you weren't actively encouraging him to join a boy band? <laughs> no, huh? no. I might have I told my kid that. <laughs> Although Philip is a guitar player and Annika played piano for a while. He had the I, hair for it, though. I was like, you don't even need to know how to play the guitar or anything. You can it's be all like about the look, pencils. right? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> he was unamused. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, thanks, mom. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, well, um, I think our 45 minutes is about up. Is, is there anything else I should have asked that I, I didn't? I really appreciate you coming on. I so much respect. I, well, I, I love you. Um, <laughs> for our audience, I would ask that you can strongly consider nominating for a living, someone for a living treasure. I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. It's a real simple. I've nominated a number of uh, folks that I've felt really strong about, and I thought that their contribution, not only as an artist but as an educator and, and and as someone who wants to see creativity grow within other people, I think it's real important. So, that's that's a lifetime commitment that that uh, the Living Treasure does honor. And so, so I, even though I'm going to retire from full time teaching, doesn't mean I'm I'm going to stop teaching. It just means I'm. I mean, I'm honor bound to philosophically that I'm, not, I'm always going to be a teacher to some extent, to a great extent, so, no matter what I do. So on to those teachers that you've had, I think does make a difference. If it's not the Living Treasure Award, nominate one of your best teachers and just in terms of a simple thank you letter will make a big difference. That's what they live for. That simple little note that you write for them carries them through the whole year, makes a big difference. So, thank it, you. it does make a big difference. But, so uh, my best, my best and favorite gifts are the thank you notes that students have written for me. Uh, one of my students, she did a 
the little book. And it was like all the silly things that I do in class. Sometimes she, she's like quoting me and, and, and like, and then throwing little funny pictures and like, and so it wasn't just like a little thing. It was like all that stuff. And then one of my favorites is the um, top 10 Michaelisms. <laughs> That's this great. Is, this is a former graduate student. And then he wrote down the top 10 things that I repeated year in, year out, because he had had me for an undergraduate and a graduate student. So that was part of his parting gift to me was the, the, the list of, of the quotes that I repeated myself on. And his favorite was, you got to be smarter than a material. Yeah, you do. <laughs> That's so good. I once got a comic strip. I used to teach journalism uh, at NWAC <laughs> and I got a comic strip. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's real. I mean, wow. Can we, what's the second chapter going to be out there? Yeah. I yeah. know. It was pretty good. I was like, oh yeah, I really am that way. <laughs> anyway. But well, it was, like, being yeah. not your efforts with the teacher makes a world of difference. So, yeah. yeah, it really does. Um, but well, thank you so much for, for, joining me and i really appreciate you coming on this this show yeah i did much better this time instead of streaming it to my own page so <laughs> cool now are you yeah will you uh post that recording yep okay <laughs> okay i'll send you a link <laughs> it's been a real pleasure scarlett i'm so much enjoy working with you and, and all the work you do at the arts council is wonderful you folks do such good work and acknowledging all the creativity in arkansas thank you well, thank you so much. I, I hope to hear from you soon. I'll probably be in like email you for stuff. Okay. All right. Very <laughs> Bye. good. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye. -bye.